All right, here in uh, Romans chapter four, this is an excellent chapter. I, I love, I love just reading this chapter. Um, this is a, a chapter I like to use a lot when I go out soul winning, and um, I'm not, I'm gonna try not to get too, too far into this chapter because the, the topic of my sermon this morning is, is about forgiveness. Okay, it's about forgiving, and the title of my sermon is forgive and forget. And we're gonna start off when we, when we go into the subject of forgiveness, of course. We have to start off with salvation, because that is the best forgiveness that you could ever receive, the eternal forgiveness for your sins. In Romans 4, I couldn't think of a better place to start here. The Bible says, look down at verse number 6, because this is going to give us a really good definition that we need to understand for forgiveness um, and what it really means. The Bible says in, in verse number 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. It's basically what it's saying. It, God gives us, he imputes unto us righteousness. That means good things, righteous things that we would do that would be good. He imputes righteousness to us without doing any works. Even without, without doing the works that would normally get you that righteousness, he gives it to you without doing the works. So he's saying that you're blessed if you receive that righteousness, if, you, if, if that's imputed unto you without any works. Verse 7 saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And here we see that definition here of, of our iniquities being forgiven. Forgiven means that, hey, your sins are covered. It's taken care of. It's all done away with. There's no more um, punishment that's going to need to be paid for those sins. Look, you've done them. You're guilty of them. But when you're forgiven, that transgression, that breaking of God's law, it's, it's covered. It's taken care of. Now, of course, with our salvation, we didn't take care of it ourselves. Jesus Christ came and he took care of that when he died on the cross and he shed his blood to cover our sins, to pay for our sins, and rose again from the dead. He did all that to pay for our sins so that in verse 8 it says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Again, there's that word impute. So he's not going to make us responsible and have to pay that punishment, that penalty for our sin. He's not going to hold us liable for those sins that we've committed um, in the eternal sense. So understanding forgiveness obviously is extremely important for just understanding salvation at all. Because there's a lot of people out there today that they think, they think, okay, well, you got to believe on Christ to be saved. But... There's always that but. If, if you were to go out and commit sin, break the law, steal, or do whatever, then all of a sudden you're not saved anymore. And then, and they believe in this, this work salvation where you have to continue to obey the law. But see, with forgiveness, the great news about forgiveness is that once you are forgiven, it's, it's, you're forgiven forever. It's forgiven and forgotten. It's gone. It's done. It's over. It's paid in full. And the reason why we know it's paid in full because our sins are covered. They're covered completely. Jesus died some 2,000 years ago. You and I were never, weren't even born. We hadn't even existed yet. You know, yet God in his foreknowledge and God is in his, his infinite wisdom and his knowledge, he knows the beginning from the end. He knows every soul that's going to live on this earth from the beginning of time to the end of time. God is outside of time. He's not constrained by that. He knew that David Burden was going to be born on April 23rd, 1977. He knew that was going to happen. And he knew all the sins I would commit during my lifetime, the sins I haven't even committed yet. He knows about those. Now, it doesn't mean he makes me do those things. Having foreknowledge doesn't mean that we don't have free will. He, he knows about them. And that's why Jesus Christ was able to pay for them some 2,000 years ago. He was able to take the sins of the whole world on himself, in his own body, to bear them for us so that he can satisfy the punishment that needs to be paid for those transgressions, for those sins. The shedding of his blood provides the remission for our sins, provides the atonement, the paying for so that God can not impute the sin on us because it's already been imputed unto Christ. When your sins were imputed unto Christ, that's why it's no longer going to be imputed unto you when you receive Christ as your Savior, when you put your faith on Him. And if you, it's important to understand, this is a great verse. 
a great chapter here kind of explaining this. If you're forgiven, the Lord will not impute sin unto you. Once you're saved, he covers all of your sins, past, present, and future. It goes for all time. It's, it's a certainty. There's no doubt about it. It's a promise that's given unto us. The Bible says in Psalm 103, 12, you don't have to turn there. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. He's completely separated us from that sin. The moment you get saved, the moment you put your faith in Christ, the moment you're born again, you have a new creature inside of you. The new spirit is born. Now, we still have the old flesh. This old flesh is going to pass away and we're going to get a new body. But we get that new spirit. And because we have that new spirit, we can look forward to a new body that we're going to get in the future. God has saved us and he separated those sins from us completely. As far I mean, East from the west, infinitely separate. He is completely separated from it. And that is what forgiveness is. And that's what it means to be forgiven. He's completely separated us from it. He said, look, you've done wrong. You deserve to pay for that sin that you've done wrong. But I've separated from you that because I've forgiven you. Now that forgiveness is conditional with our salvation. It's conditional on the fact that we have to receive Christ as our Savior. Otherwise, you're not forgiven. Otherwise, he doesn't grant you that forgiveness. Otherwise, he will impute your sins unto you. You have to be saved. But once you do that, hey, and it's not by your own works of righteousness. It's not anything that you do. Just, it's just accepting the free gift that God has given you. It's just recognizing that you, you've done wrong. You receive a punishment. That you, de you deserve a punishment. But God has a gift for you. It's free. You just have to receive it. Once you do, he forgives you of everything. That just goes to show, we're going to get in a little bit later on how loving that is. I mean, forgiveness and love are, are go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. But um, we're going to see, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter number 8. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read, because that's there's a quote in Hebrews 8 from the Old Testament, and the quote from the Old Testament is in Jeremiah 31. I'll read that to you while you're turning to Hebrews 8. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, the Bible says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And this is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8. So in Jeremiah 31, this is in the Old Testament, he's talking about the new covenant. They're, they're already prophesying the new covenant that's going to come. Um, people in the Old Testament were not ignorant of the, thing, of the new covenant that was going to happen with Jesus Christ shedding his blood on the cross. They knew a Messiah was coming. They knew there was going to be a Christ. They didn't know him by name, but they knew it was going to happen because it's been prophesied all throughout Scripture. People have always been saved the same way through their faith. Um, not of the works of righteousness, as we saw in Romans 4 with Abraham being, um, um, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath worked of glory, but not before God. Abraham was not justified by his works. Abraham had faith in God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. If you're in Hebrews 8, look at verse number 7. This is the quoting of Jeremiah 31. It says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And this is the second aspect of forgiveness that we see, is that not only does God forgive our sins, but he promises not to even remember them. So it's not even in God's remembrance the sins that we've committed, the sins that we've done. He completely blots them out. He completely puts them out of his mind as if we had never even done them. 
That's an amazing thing. It's one thing to say, well, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to look past the transgression that you've done against me. But it's, a, it's another thing then to add forgetting that completely. And I think true forgiveness, these two things are tied one to the other. That in order to truly, completely forgive somebody, you have to forget about it. You have to let it go. You can't allow that transgression to come back and to be mindful of it again if you're going to if you're going to um, be truly forgiven you know if you think about something that someone has done to you think about a, a wrong that someone has done to you i mean whether it be a spouse a family member you know a friend whatever think about a time where you've been wrong where someone has done wrong to you now if you truly forgive you say you know what i forgive you for that for what you've done if you truly forgive them you're not going to keep bringing that up again you know like you get an argument later on and you say, well, what about that time when you took my, you know, okay, that just proves you didn't forgive them. And that's why it's so important that you, in order to forgive someone, you got to just forget about it. You got to put it out of your mind. You got to forgive and forget and just, and just put it out of your mind. And this is something that we all need to have toward each other in general. I mean, when, when you're going to forgive someone, you ought to forgive it, forget it, excuse me. But this is going to help you tremendously in your marriage. Okay, anyone who's married this morning, this is going to help you out to... Because, to, look, <laughs> everybody is human. We all have faults. We all have problems. And when you live with somebody for a long time, day in, day out, your spouse is going to do you wrong. It's going to happen. We're human. We're not perfect. I'm sure there are plenty of times where I've done wrong to my wife and did stuff that wasn't just or wasn't right. And you know what? It's the same thing with her. But in order to have a healthy marriage, and turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, in order to have a healthy marriage, you're going to need to learn this concept of forgiving and forgetting. It's extremely important because you don't want to keep rehashing old things that have come up, that have been brought up in the past, and just keep throwing it in their face because all that's going to do is bring resentment and bitterness. You need to be able to move past things. You need to be able to look. And look, if Christ was able to do that, if God is able to do that for you, we ought to be able to do that for our spouse and for, and for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for anyone that wrongs you. You ought to be able to be able to have that heart of forgiveness where you can just say, and the humility to do it. Because it's going to take some humility. If you have pride, you're not going to be able to forgive people. Forgive people. You're not going to be able to forgive it. You're not going to be able to forget it. If you're lifted up, and you think so highly of yourself, you go, how could you possibly do that to me? To me! Because I'm so great, I'm so, you know, you have that proud attitude, you're not going to be able to forgive you. It takes a humility, it takes a humbleness mm -hmm. to be able to lower yourself and to be able to accept that and say, you know what? You did wrong, but I'm just going to let it go and forgive it, and I'm not even going to think about it again. And this is going to help you in, in your marriage. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 26. The Bible says, be ye angry... And sin not. So here we see, you know, there's a lot of false beliefs that people think it's just, it's, it's a sin automatically to be angry. That's not true. You can be angry, and you can be angry with a righteous anger, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he says, so it's, that's why he says, be angry and sin not. So you got to be careful when you get angry. I mean, Jesus Christ got angry when he tipped over the money changers' tables, and he had the whip, and he drove them out of the temple. But he had a righteous anger, okay? But... You can't let that anger fester and, 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 you know, it's not like there's very many situations where necessarily where you're going to have righteous anger, but there is times when you can't be angry and it's righteous. He says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay? And that's really important to understand that because you might get in a fight with your spouse. You might get in a fight with somebody, right? And, and, and you're going back and forth, and you're angry, and, and someone's wronged you, and you get a fight, he says, look, don't sin, don't let that sun go down on my wrath. So he's saying, at the end of the day, you need to be able to let it go. You can't let that fester inside of you, because it will. It'll just root bitterness in your soul. It'll, it'll, if, you, if you just keep thinking about it, and, and, and pondering on it, and not letting it go, and not being able to forgive it's going to stick with you. It's going to stick in your mind, and it's, and it's not going to, it's not going to be good. It's going to be sinning, too. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Let's keep reading. Verse number 27 says, neither give place to the devil. And this is what the devil wants to do. If he wants to destroy your marriage, he's going to want you to be bitter against your spouse. Because that's just going to, going to cause a, a downward spiral, a snowball effect of just 
more and more and more, and you're going to keep on bringing up past transgressions, and you're going to keep on thinking about these things instead of just letting them go. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give them that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He's saying, don't get caught up in this bitterness, the wrath, the anger, the strife, the fighting, evil speaking, just talking bad about each other, name calling, all this stuff. Put it away from you. He says, be kind one to another. And in order to be kind, if someone's doing wrong, you're going to have to forgive them. You're going to have to look past the iniquities, the transgressions that have been done against you. He says, tender hearted, not having a hard heart, a stony heart that, that can't forgive people, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God forgave you of all the wrongs that you've done against God. If you count them up, there's a lot. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you look on the outside. You've got a lot of sins against God. And if you don't think you do, you need to read the Bible cover to cover because there's a lot of things that the Bible tells us that are wrong. We have a lot of sin in our life. And, and there's sins that, that you might not even know are sins that you've done. God has a high standard for our righteousness. He wants us to be holy, to be separate, and to obey what he has for us. We have a lot of transgressions that we've committed against him, but he's forgiven us. He has granted us that forgiveness. We need to keep that in mind and ever be mindful of the fact that the wrongs that we've done against God have been forgiven unto us likewise. We need to have that type of a, of a godly attitude towards other people. If God's able to look past our sins and our iniquities and say, okay, this is satisfied, this is covered. You're forgiven. I'm not even going to remember anymore. I'm not going to be bringing it up to you. What you've done, it's gone. It's forgiven. It's done. We need to have that same type of an attitude with, with, with people that wrong us. Now, We've already covered to this point the forgiveness that we receive from God that covers our souls eternally. I wanted to make sure we covered that first. But now we're going to get into a little bit more of the meat. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 6. Because there's lots of verses. I mean, there's, there's tons of scripture in the sermon. I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to it all. I mean, forgiveness is a huge concept in the Bible, obviously. I mean, it has to do, for one, with our salvation. It's incredibly important. But not just that. See, there's a lot of verses that people will try to turn to to try to twist Scripture and make you think that it's, that it's teaching a works-based salvation. So what we're going to get into now is a lot of those verses, but hopefully you'll be able to understand the difference between when the Bible's talking about forgiveness, it's not always just talking about your soul being saved from hell. Okay? There's a forgiveness that you can receive even from God for the things that you do in this lifetime from, being, from having to receive the punishment in this lifetime of things you do. The Bible says, For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you decide, as a child of God, yes, you are forgiven of all of your sins in the eternal sense, in the sense that you never have to pay for those sins in hell. But that doesn't mean that if you continue to sin in this lifetime, that God won't still judge you in this lifetime. See, your soul is saved but there's still, there's still a recompense that you can reap from the wrongs that you do while you're living on this earth. And this is what we're going to deal with now. This is what a lot of these verses have to do with. If you're in Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at this. Because this is more of like a, temp, a temporal uh, forgiveness. Look at verse number 11 of Matthew 6. The Bible says, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A prayer unto God, of course, is talking about the, um, the Lord's Prayer, right? Real, real famous. A lot of people have this memorized. But um, he said, you know, in the prayer, we're asking God, you should be asking God, you know, forgive us our debts, what we owe to you, God, as we forgive our debtors. We're forgiving other people that owe us. So you see us, we're forgiving them. God, please be, be merciful to us and forgive us the same way that we're having this attitude towards them. 
It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And we see a similar thing in Mark 11. You don't have to turn there. Stay in Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew 18. But in Mark 11, the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, verse 24, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, these are two verses that, that people will like to take and say, Look, see, no, you have to do something else. They'll, they'll try to turn to these scriptures and say, okay, well, look, if you don't forgive people, then God's not going to forgive you. Then that means you're not saved. So, so your sins are not forgiven, you're going to go to hell when you die. And this is the, the, the twisting that they'll try to use. And I'm going to get into why that's so perverted. Matthew 18, look if you would in verse 21. Matthew 18, 21, we're going to spend some time here. Matthew 18, 21, the Bible says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. That's a good question. Said, how often shall my brother come? And if he sins against me, how many times should I just forgive him? He said, seven times? Should I, I mean, if he does it seven times, should I forgive him? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And look, that number, 490, is not like some number that God said, okay, if it's 491, then don't forgive anymore. He's using that as an example. Obviously, it's a figure of speech. You say, look, not seven, look, 70 times seven. He's throwing out a big number um, because he's just saying, can, just continue to forgive. That's what he's saying with his speech there. So, you know, you don't have to keep track and have a, have a chalkboard and start going, well, all right, you're on 300. You better watch it because you've only got a little bit left. Um, it's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, look, your brother forgives you or, or sins against you, forgive him. And that show, I mean, that's kind of showing God's boundless forgiveness that he has for us. And that's another reason, you know, even though, you know, once you're saved, once you put your faith in Christ, you are still a sinner. We still have this flesh, and it's a continual battle. You ought to be fighting against the flesh and trying to walk in the spirit. But I'll tell you what, I'm not perfect, and I don't know anybody that is. We're going to continue to sin, but God's forgiveness still continues to cover those sins. Okay, he still continues to forgive us those sins for, that, that we might continue to do on a daily basis. But it's a, and, you know, and that's the eternal forgiveness that we've received from him, which is why we ought to forgive those that trespass against us. That's why he says until 70 times 7. But let's continue reading here, verse 23. It says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto, likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, in payment to be made. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their lord all that was done. Then his lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay what due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses." So again, this is, a, this is a portion of scripture that work salvation people will try to turn to and tell you, look, no, you have to, you have to do this or else, you know, or else you're not going to be saved or else you're not forgiven of your sins. You have to have this type of heart. This isn't true. And I'm going to go into this for many reasons. First of all, beware when people want to give you like 
like solid doctrine from a parable. Because this is a parable. This is a parable of a man, right? They explain a parable. There's a man, he had servants, right? One guy owed him a whole bunch of money. He owed him a lot of money. So he goes up to his servant and says, okay, look. Like, and, and he wants it, and he goes, he's like, okay, the time's due, you owe me. Pay, me. pay me what you owe me. And he falls out of his knees, he said, look, be merciful, you know, give me some more time and I'll pay you back. Just, just, just be patient with me and I'll pay you your money. So then this, the Lord, he has compassion on him, he says, okay, I'm just going to forgive you that day. Uh, the goodness of our, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna forgive that to you. Then that same guy goes and turns on someone else that owed him money, right? And it was a much, much smaller amount. And he was just, and he had no compassion on him. He just said, "Nope, you're gonna pay me. I don't care. You know, I don't care what you have to do. You're going to prison until you pay that debt." And had no compassion on him. So this is what happens in this parable, right? And then in the parable it says that um, the master of the first servant that was forgiven of that debt. He came back and was like, no, you should have, you should have been compassionate. Likewise, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast you and, and deliver you to the tormentors till you pay all that was due. So there's truths to be had in parables. Okay, there's a lot of truth. Obviously, they're there for a reason. They're there to help teach us and help us understand. But if you're going to get your core doctrine just based on a parable, okay, parables are not always like, like, okay, in the Bible, you have, you have parables, and then you have, like, clear statements, right? There's a lot of places where, where it's just a clear, factual statement. You know, the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a clear statement. Jesus wasn't giving a parable when he, when he made that statement. He wasn't saying, well, this truth is like this story, right? And the problem with using a parable to get your solid doctrine from, instead of just using it to support your doctrine, when you just base your doctrine on a parable, it's a story. You can start interpreting this in many different ways. You need to be able to glean the truth from the parable of why he's even telling it to begin with, instead of just saying, no, this is the reason why you have to do works to be saved, when you already have a mountain of evidence that says to the contrary. So if something doesn't make a little bit of sense, let's go to the clear-cut statements first. Just a flat-out statement to say, okay, this is where we get our doctrine from. This is our fundamentals. This is the foundation of what we believe. It's clearly written in the, in the Bible. It's just flat out, that's what it says. There is no room for interpretation. It's, it says what it says. Now, a parable is a story. That's where he's likening things. So what we see here in the story, I'm going to help explain the story a little bit to you in case, in case it is a little bit confusing. I know a lot of Christians have problems with verses like this because there's so many people out there that are trying to twist it. This is definitely not regarding our spiritual salvation for many reasons. First of all, in, Act, in Matthew 18, verse 26, what did the servant say here? So God's coming, and he's, or not God, or, you know, if you, if you say that that master is God, right, which, which it is, right, he's, he's, he's the, the figure for God in this story, that, that master of the servant. He comes to his servant, and he commands, um, he reckons with him, it's time of reckoning to pay, he owed him 10,000 talents, but since he couldn't pay the Lord, first it says he commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, everything he had, and he needs his payment. But then he has compassion on him, he forgives him. And, and his servant, though, when this is required of him, before he's forgiven, in verse 26, it says, The servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. So what he's pleading to him with, he's not asking for forgiveness. He's not saying, you know, I'm believing and just please forgive me, Lord. I'm just trusting on you to forgive me. He's saying, I'm going to pay you everything I owe you. Just give me a little bit more time. He's saying, just, just, just give me some time. Now, look, if this parable we're talking about our salvation, is that how you go to God with what you owe, with the debt of sin that you owe, and say, God, just give me a little more time so I can just clean up my life and be a little bit better? Is that how you get saved? Absolutely not. And, and there's a mount of scripture against it. So we can see right off the bat when he's going to him and he receives forgiveness. He says, I'm going to pay thee all. It's not that his heart was in the place of, of I want forgiveness and I'm looking to you to forgive me, which would be your eternal salvation. He's going to him and, ask, and, and he receives forgiveness, even though he was asking, even though he's saying, look, I'm going to make good on this. I'm still going to pay you everything I owe you. This is the first clue that this is not talking about our eternal salvation. 
But people then like to, to look at verse 34 and they'll say, oh, well, it says in verse 34 that he delivered them to the tormentors, right? So that must be referring to hell because he delivered them to the tormentors. Now, I've heard this quite a bit. Well, first of all, if this parable is referencing hell, if that, if that is, if you say, okay, so he delivered them to hell, then this is teaching flat out works-based salvation. It is. I mean, it's, if that's what this is talking about, if you're saying, well, you went to hell because you didn't have compassion on, on your friend after you've been forgiven already, then that's teaching a works-based salvation. And again, there's a mount of evidence that shows that that's not true. But second of all, even without, without having to, to, to look at that, that word torment, just because the word torment is used, it does not automatically mean it's talking about hell. The word torment is not synonymous with hell. Now, yes, there are lots of verses that will say, you know, there, um, like in, in Luke with, with, the, with the rich man, Lazarus, you know, he says, in hell being in torments, he lives up. Yeah, hell is a place of torment. No doubt about it. I won't argue that. But hell is not the only time that torment is ever used for a description. And I'll read some verses for you. It says in Matthew 8, 6, because there's other places in the Bible that use the word torment. Matthew 8, 6 says, in saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. So here's a man that has palsy, right? He has a sickness. Grievously tormented. So there it uses the word torment. Is, is being sick of the palsy being in hell? I don't think so. It just means he's sick. It just means he's tormented. He's plagued with the sickness. Hebrews 11.37 says they were stoned. This is a, uh, the faith chapter. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Again, this is people on earth. They were, they were saints. They were going through hard times, trials, relations. They were tormented. Does that mean they were in hell? Absolutely not. It just means they were tormented. It means they were, they were going through like some kind of torture, some kind of bad time. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So again, just being fearful, this fear hath torment. It doesn't mean that you're in hell. It just means fear hath torment. Revelation 9, 5 says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So, you know, I bring all these verses up just to show you that just because that word torment is used in this par parable, it doesn't mean it's just talking about, about hell. It means that he was just going to require him to pay his debt until it was owed. So he was delivered to the tormentors. I mean, they weren't, his life was not going to be fun. It was not going to be very pleasant paying all that debt that he owed that he required of them. So, okay, so what is this parable talking about, right? I mean, we can see it's not talking about our salvation. It's, it's evidence, it's clear. There's, there's too many things that would, that, would, that would contradict Scripture. And in order for the Bible to be true, there's no contradiction. For, for it to be God's Word, God's Word does not contradict itself. It's, it's perfect. It's pure. So how do we understand this, then? What is it talking about? Well, the best way for me to help illustrate the difference is the concept of being a child of God. So the moment that you're born again, your past, present, and future sins, as I mentioned earlier, they were forgiven. They're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, but now you're a child of God. And God has expectations for you as a child, and there are consequences for our actions as well. So like my children, right, and I love this illustration. I use it all the time when I go out soul winning because it helps people understand, oh, yeah, so if I'm a child of God, then I'm all, I mean, you're always a child, right? My, my daughters are always my daughters, no matter what they do. Now, I have rules for them. I expect them to obey my rules, and guess what? They don't always obey my rules. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to figure that out, but, you know, they're kids. They, they don't always obey my rules. They're not perfect, right? They sin against me, against their mother. They transgress. They do wrong. But I love them. If they break every single one of my rules, I'm still going to love them. Any good father would. And we know that the Lord is the best father. They're my children. But <clears throat> it, doesn't, it also doesn't mean that just because they're my children, they have no consequences for their actions. Right? So when they start breaking my rules, what's going to happen? They're going to get disciplined. Right? They'll get the spankings. They'll get, you know, 
the discipline that they need because they've broken a rule. They've transgressed. They've sinned. Now, what this is saying is if your heart is right, if you have a heart that's humble, you're not lifted up with pride. You make a mistake, but, you know, when other people do you wrong, you're, you're showing forgiveness to them. You're not, you're not just going to, you know, be holding everybody else liable for the things that you do or for the things that they do against you. God's going to see that, and he'll take mercy on you, and he'll say, okay, you, you are being very forgiving. You're, you're, you're allowing a lot, a lot of room for other people to make mistakes. He'll be able to look at that and allow room for us to make the mistakes that we do in this lifetime. Because in this lifetime, when you when you transgress, if you decide to just, just break God's commandments and break his rules, look, he's never going to cast you into hell because you're his son. But he, as, a, as a loving father, he's going to discipline you. He's going to chastise you and give you the punishment that you need. But he can take it easy on you, so to speak, if your heart is right, if your attitude is right, if you're not just rebelling and being stiff-necked against God. If you have the right heart, if you have the humble attitude, He'll be able to notice that, recognize, and he could he could extend some mercy unto you. I don't know. I mean, hopefully that helps make sense. See, when God sees us living the way He told us to, when He sees us doing justly, showing mercy, walking humbly, then He'll do the same for us. And um, you know, if we face it, we're not perfect. <laughs> we could use a lot of forgiveness in our lives already. I mean, we understand we're forgiven from everything eternally, but. Even just going forward, you know, if you're going to be holding other people's infractions over their head every time someone sins against you, hey, God's going to do the same for you. You're going to reap what you sow in that sense. And this is what the Bible is really talking about when it says, judge not that you be not judged. Okay, this is, this is that truth. Um, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Because we're going to look at that verse. A lot of people will try to tell you, oh, judge not, and they just leave it at judge not. People will tell you, okay, judge not means you can't ever say anything that anyone's doing is wrong because you're a sinner and they're saying you can't ever say it's wrong. That's not what it's talking about, okay? That's not what it means. The Bible says, judge not that, and ye shall not be judged. Look at Luke 6, verse 37. And, and this, this kind of fires me up a little bit when, when you hear people say, oh, judge not, judge not. You want to say that like, look, sodomy is wrong. Being a queer is wrong. God puts a death penalty on it. He says, look, if a man shall lie with mankind, lie with a woman, you know, he shall be put to death, his blood shall be upon him. That's what the Bible says. Oh, well, don't judge, don't judge. Look, it's what the Bible says. That's what it's saying. And you can, you can continue to preach the truth and preach against the sin and preach against the wickedness, and it's not that you're judging. Look, God's already judged. It's in his book. It's in his law book. And he's, a, he's the one that's given a commandment. It says, judge not and ye shall not be judged. Verse 37 of Luke 6. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. This is talking about, and Matthew 7 explains it a lot clearer, where it's saying, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged against. So he's saying, look, if you're going to judge, don't be a hypocrite about it. So if you're going to say, Hey, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol, then you go back and you're and you're you're pounding out of the beers. You're a hypocrite. God's gonna judge you just like you judge that other person because you're doing it in, as a hypocrite. You're doing the same exact thing and you're telling other people not to do that. That is what this judge not that you be not judged is talking about. It's not saying you can never say anything about God's word and about things being right or wrong. He's just saying don't be a hypocrite when you judge. He's saying, condemn not, be not, look at verse number 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable, a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So this judging not that you be not judged is basically what he's saying, what is, is the same concept that we should use with forgiving other people. When you, when you, um, when someone does you wrong, if you don't forgive them, God's going to look at that and he'll say, okay, well, I'm not going to forgive you. The amount of mercy you extend to other people, God will look at that likewise and say, okay, 
I'm going to do the same thing because I see how you're living the way, that, the way that you're supposed to. And earlier in this chapter in Luke 6, it provides more depth to how we ought to be living our life and the, ought to, the attitudes that we ought to have, the Christian attitude that we ought to have with people. Look at verse number 27 of Luke 6. Verse 27. It says, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Again, this is going to require a humble attitude. When you have, when you have an enemy, someone who hates you, right? Someone who, wants, who, want, who wishes ill against you, he says, do good to them which hate you. That's going to require humility. If you have too much pride, you're going to, you're going to bristle that and say no. And, and, and let's face it, our natural instinct is not to do good to those that hate you. That's not, that's, not the, that's not the first response that you normally come with as, as, as in this flesh, and the flesh body that we have. That's not what, what's going to be the first thing that comes to your mind. He says, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And um, it says, and unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love them that love, also love those that love them. And if ye be good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. This is the truth that we need to learn, that, that even though people have done you wrong, even though you have enemies, even though people hate you, even though you, know, you say, look, lend and don't even expect to get it back. Look, if you just, just lend, people ask you for some help, you know, you can lend them stuff. Don't, don't hope to get it back again. Just, just let it be. Don't, um, don't get caught up in that. He says, and your reward shall be great in heaven, and you shall be the children of the highest. You're going to get a great reward if you can live with this type of an attitude. It says, for he is kind. Talking about God. He is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. We're all wicked sinners in God's, in God's eyes. In the sense that, look, we've done wrong. We've transgressed his law. You know, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags to him. He looks at us, it's just, it's just dirty. It's filthy. Because he's so holy. He looks at us and he's extended so much mercy to us. We need to be merciful also. We need to be able to forgive others. When they transgress against us, we need to be able to just let it go. It might not be your first instinct. But remember these verses. Because the Bible says, hey, great is your reward in heaven. If you can do this, if you can, if you can swallow your pride and just, and just live this way, God says, great is your reward in heaven. Hey, when someone curses you and hates you, pray for them. And I forget the reference. I think it's in 1 Peter. He talks about, um, in so doing, you're going to heap coals of fire on your head, too. Keep that in mind, too. When, when you do what's right, when God sees you and says, okay, you're obeying God's commandments. He's told you to do good to your enemy. He's told you to pray for him. He's told you to walk this certain way. Now, if people still continue to just, to just do wrong against you, look, God will take care of that. The Bible says that, you know, I am the Lord, I will recompense. God is the one who's going to repay. We don't have to settle the score. We just need to do what he told us to do. When he tells us to be merciful, he tells us to walk humbly, he tells us just to say, okay, you know what, people are doing it wrong, don't worry about it. And the more that you are just, just doing what he wants you to do, when people attack you, uh, you better watch, that person better watch out. You know, when, 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 when you are doing everything, you are in God's good graces, you're, you're you know, doing your best to have this, this humble attitude and, and to help people and to serve God and do what's right, and you're not just going to fly out the handle, you're not going to take matters in your own hands, you have total faith in God, hey, God's going to bless you for that, and he's going to take care of the other. 
And um, we don't need to worry about that. And if that person's not saved, hey, you don't need to right that wrong because if they die and go to hell, they're going to get theirs anyways. Now, we, and, and that's another reason why we ought to love the people because you, <laughs> you ought not to just wish people to die and go to hell, even if they're your enemy. You know, we ought to have the love in our hearts to preach them the gospel. Now, if you have this bitterness because they've done you wrong and you can't forgive them, then how are you going to preach them the gospel? I mean, preaching them the gospel and trying to, trying to get them saved so that their, their sins and their iniquities can be covered the same way that yours were, you're going to have a hard time doing that if you don't have that love in your heart, if you can't forgive them of the wrong they've, they've done to you. And... Um, you know, just, just another reason. But God will take care of everything. He makes sure that people reap what they sow and they get what they need to get. But um, we don't need to worry about that. We need to be merciful. I'm going to have to skip. Uh, the Bible explains. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. But um, in Luke 7, Jesus is talking to, um, to Simon. And he, and he gives him this parable. And he tells him, look, you know, there was a certain creditor, he had two debtors. One owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And he's saying he forgave both of them. And he asked him, he said, who's going to love him more? And he answers right. He says, well, I suppose to him whom he forgave the most. So the person who's forgiven of the most amount of money, he's going to be the most grateful, the most thankful. He's going to have the most love for, um, for that. And, and Jesus says, you're right. You know, that's true. And he says, you see this woman, because, you know, this woman came in and he, and he was, um, she was washing his feet with her tears and with the hair of her head. And he looked at that like, oh, if he knew that she was this sinner, you know, he wouldn't have her want to touch him. And that's why he gives him this parable. He said, look, he says, thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. He said, my head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And again, kind of going back to the marriage thing with, with the forgiveness, the more you can forgive your spouse, the more they should love you. You're extending mercy on them. You're extending that, that type of a, you know, and if there are a lot of transgressions, maybe there are. I mean, there shouldn't be, but maybe there are. You can't control that, right? It's, it's, we all have our own individual lives, our own free will that, that, you know, maybe you are doing things that are right and that are good, and, and it is the other person's fault. I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. If someone is doing you that type of wrong, the more you forgive them, the more that they should love you. I mean, Jesus Christ said that in this parable that, you know, they're going to be thankful. that They ought to be thankful for that. Once they realize that you've truly forgiven them and that they were wrong, I mean, maybe they don't understand if they're not wrong. You know, if they, if they don't understand they've done wrong, then they're not going to realize that they've been forgiven. But um, once they come to that realization, and, you know, the same thing with us in our salvation, again, you know, we realize we've done wrong. Hey, that should motivate you to want to serve God and, and to love Him and do what He expected you to, expects you to do since He's forgiven you such a great debt, since He's forgiven you so much that you owe. Love and forgiveness are tied together. I'm going to close with this. The more you forgive a person, the more that you love them. That's how you show your love towards them, by forgiving them. And uh, turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're gonna, this is the last place we'll turn. Second Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2 is talking about a man here. In 1 Corinthians, there was, there was the story of this man who was, you know, committing this sin in the church. And um, he had his father's wife. It was a grievous sin. And he said, look, you need to kick that guy out of your church. You need to, you know, he's like, I've judged already, not even, you know, not even being there. He's like, I've already judged. This is wickedness. This needs to, to go out of the church. He's a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. This needs to be taken care of. He needs, he says, you need to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. And, and this is a, an issue they had to deal with. But in 2 Corinthians, we see that that issue is dealt with. And now we're talking about that guy coming back to church. Because he had, he had repented, he got gotten right. In, in verse number 6 of 2 Corinthians 2, the Bible says, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So he's saying, look, 
The punishment that he received was sufficient. That's enough. You don't need to keep going at him. You don't need to keep, you know, just holding it over his head. He says, now you ought rather to forgive him, comfort him, you know, comfort him, build him up, strengthen him, and lest perhaps such one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. When you continue to just, just harp on the same thing and just hold people's sins over their heads and you can't forgive them, hey, that's going to, I mean, that's going to cause sorrow. It's like, man, what can I ever do to get past this? You know, I've done wrong, but like, it, you know, if someone's not going to forgive you of that, you kind of get to this point of like, what can I possibly do? How can I get past this? He's saying, look, you don't want to be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Verse 8 says, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. He's saying, look, now I'm writing to you because I want to make sure that you're obedient in all things. They were obedient in the other things where they had to kick him out and take care of the problem. But now in all things, are you able to forgive him? Are you able to confirm your love for him and look past it and just let it go? Verse 10 says, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Look at this verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. One of Satan's devices is to use this lack of forgiveness to split people apart, to split churches apart, to split families apart. Look, Satan has his devices he wants to get an advantage of us. We need to have this spirit of forgiveness. We need to be able to forgive people, love them, accept them back. Look, if anyone in this church ever did anything, I preached a sermon about a month ago on, you know, sins that can get you kicked out of church. Right? I brought this up then. There are certain sins that I say, look, it's not allowed in God's house. A little leaven leaven the whole love. Now, look, we're all sinners. I know that. But there are certain things that you can do that's not going to be allowed here, and you're going to be gone. But if, a per if that ever happens to a person, and they repent, they come back, they say, look, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it anymore. I realize what I did was wrong. We ought to just forgive them. Don't ever bring that up to them again. There's no reason for it. We need to forgive and forget. Accept them back. Comfort them. Love them. Look, that person, if that person's a brother, right? I mean, they're, they're a brother that was in church. They're a brother in the Lord. We need to be able to accept them back. And, and just accept that, that they've gotten right with God. Say, okay, here, it's like it never happened. And that's the type of forgiveness we ought to have. Uh, the last verse I'm going I'm to quote here in, in Luke 17, in verse 3, it says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So he's saying, look, when your, when your brother in Christ does you wrong, he says, he comes to you, he says, look, I'm sorry, I repent, I'm not going to do it anymore, forgive him. And if it happens seven times, it's the same thing, and it keeps happening over and over again, yet he, he just comes back and says, look, I'm sorry, I did it again, you know, whatever, forgive him. And that's the type of attitude we, we ought to have. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate in this, in this society, you know, we don't really live in a, in a world, you know, people like to claim... How, how loving God is and merciful and everything else, yet we live in a society that, that doesn't really understand forgiveness. You think about the justice system. Our current justice system, you commit a crime, and there's all these different, there's tons of crimes, and that crime just follows you around for the rest of your life. Like, you just can't get rid of that. There is no forgiveness. There's no, like, hey, look, I went to jail or whatever it is. I paid my debt. It should be done, yet it follows you around, and, and it just brings you down. And it's a good illustration because this is what, what, what happens when you don't have the proper forgiveness, when you can't let things go, it follows you around forever, and it just keeps that person down. I mean, if people commit a felony, or people, you know, if they, they commit something, and it was wrong, okay? They realize what they've done is wrong. Maybe when they were a teenager, they got involved in something stupid, right? They... they you know, stole some cars or whatever, and then and it turned into this felony offense. Now, and they, and they went to jail, or they, they, they paid what they had to, whatever the, you know, justice says they had to pay. It's been done. It's taken care of. They paid their debt. They made it right. Yet now for the rest of their life, anytime they want to get a job, anytime they want to do anything for God, or anytime they want to do anything at all with the rest of their life, it just follows around. It's, hand, it's hung over their head. 
There is no forgiveness, and that's not biblical. That's not right. Now, with some sin, with some crimes, there's, they're not getting the proper punishment. If you had the proper punishment, like for the perverts and the pedophiles, you know, people say, oh, well, what about these guys? They're going to go out and do it again. Well, not if you do the biblical judgment and you just kill them. If you actually have the death penalty for the things that God has ordained the death penalty for, they're not going to go out and do it again. You don't need to keep a registration list. You don't need to keep up and follow them everywhere they go because they're not going to be a problem anymore because they're going to be dead because that's the way that God ordained it. And you know what? It's going to do a lot more to scare other people into committing those types of crimes instead of thinking, oh, I'm just going to get slapped on the wrist. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll register somewhere. I'm going to keep on going, going to doing the same exact wicked things that I'm going to do. But this society has gotten backwards with our justice and our sense of justice and our judgment. And also, not just with the judgment and the punishment, but with the forgiveness. We ought to be able to forgive. Look, when someone's in your wrongs, let it go. Forgive that person as Christ has forgiven you for the sins that you've committed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, help us as Christians. It's not always easy sometimes to forgive people. Um, we get upset. We have a tendency to get emotional over things, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to separate some of those emotions to allow us to not be too prideful and have a humble spirit, dear God, that we can show people forgiveness in, in the likeness of Christ, the way that you were able to, to endure so much for us out of love. Dear God, help us to, to love people more, to have this type of forgiveness that we can forgive and we can forget. Lord, when we decide to forgive someone that we don't ever even try to remember it again, just put it out of our minds and to move forward, dear Lord. And I uh, thank you so much for this teaching. Just help us all to, um, to try to, to live our lives according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.